In preparation for this video, I scoured Google using terms such as best indie games or best indie platformers and even best indie soundtracks. I was expecting to see massive lists of indie games that would include at least some mention of Frozen Bytes Trine series, but it just wasn't to be. The only mentions to the Trine series came from automated lists using Steam or Metacritic to compile them. And it's not like the series hasn't sold well. Back in 2014, it was reported that the entire franchise had sold upwards of 7 million units. And still, it seems as though nobody has given this series its due. I mean to change that. Surely a game series that is almost 10 years old deserves some love by those who call themselves fans. I'll openly admit that I have a love for this series that was formed in my youth, but I'll do my best to look at these games in a fair light. Back in 2009, the indie gaming scene was still establishing itself as a legitimate force in the gaming world. Both Braid and Spelunky had released the year before, and Super Meat Boy wouldn't release until 2010. Thus, Trine could be considered one of the key titles that helped to lay the foundations of the modern indie gaming industry. Trine wasn't Frozen Byte's first game, though. That honor belongs to Shadowgrounds, a sci-fi top-down shooter released four years prior. However, Trine and its fictional universe are clearly what they're known for now. Between three mainline releases, an upcoming fourth game, and a spin-off title, the fantasy story started in 2009 has blossomed into one of the most varied and vibrant fictional worlds I've ever had the pleasure to experience. When speaking of fantasy settings, the Elder Scrolls series, specifically Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim, are often brought up to compare generic fantasy settings with those that have a sense of identity. Oblivion is often criticized for being overly generic with its distinctly Western European landscapes and architecture. Conversely, many praise the alien nature of Morrowind's setting, with its giant mushrooms, strange architecture, and unfamiliar creatures. Skyrim's distinct Scandinavian influences are similarly lauded. Trine's setting, at first glance, appears to fall squarely in the realm of generic fantasy. In fact, it seems to fall a little too squarely into the realm of generic fantasy. Almost any trope that can be found in fantasy settings is present and accounted for in Trine's world and characters. It's almost as if the game's creators had a massive checklist of what a fantasy world should have and methodically checked off each item as it was added to the game. In doing so, they didn't create yet another generic fantasy video game world. They created THE generic fantasy video game world. And this overly generic world ends up being so generic that it goes full circle, creating a fantasy setting that is truly unique, purely by its nature of not being unique at all. What this means for the world of Trine is that it immediately feels recognizable, without seeming derivative of anything in particular, because its foundation is derivative of everything. But Trine's influences extend beyond traditional high fantasy. First and foremost, Trine's world is influenced by the light-hearted kind of fantasy that is often found in children's picture books. I'll refer to these sorts of light-hearted fantasies as fairy tales, and Trine seems to pay homage to them first and foremost, with high fantasy trappings used when necessary to help fill out the world. From the Dr. Seuss-esque telescope from the game's tutorial, to Pontius the Knight's entire character, to the giant glowing mushrooms, all the way to the narrator's voice. All these things show that Trine is a fairy tale first, and a fantasy second. If I had to compare Trine's world to a more recognizable one, I'd pick Disney's Tangled. I love Tangled for many of the same reasons I love Trine. Its general atmosphere is just so warm and inviting. Even when night falls, and it feels like anything could be lurking in the shadows, just outside the reach of a small campfire. As more and more games in the series have been released, the fantasy aspects of the Trine universe have gained weight. But the fairy tale core is still the basis for the world, and continues to be one of the defining traits that makes Trine such a uniquely generic series.
The success with which Trine is able to pull off this setting is due in large part to the game's competent gameplay. By that, I mean that the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Trine is perfectly playable, with responsive controls that feel right. However, the gameplay hasn't been polished to the mirror-like sheen that other platformers, such as Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, have managed to attain. Trine feels good to play, but it doesn't feel incredible. All things considered, like the budget, schedule, and size of the development team, I think that it is a miracle that Trine plays as well as it does. This competent control stems largely from the solid movement and jumping, a trait that is identical between all three playable characters. In the original game, the only basic movement option that isn't identical between the three is swimming, with Amadeus and Zoya being able to swim freely, and Pontius sinking like a rock in water. This makes sense from a world-building standpoint, but was abandoned later in the series. The thing that really sets Trine apart from other platformers comes in the form of Zoya's grappling hook, and Amadeus's magical ability to levitate objects and conjure magical boxes and planks. Grappling hooks are one of the most fun items in video games. From The Legend of Zelda's hookshot to Batman's grappling gun, a well-executed grappling hook can be an incredible source of fun gameplay. Zoya's grappling hook is one of the best in gaming, period. It's useful throughout the entire game and allows for skillful players to bypass many of the game's obstacles. In fact, Zoya's grappling hook is so good that she's almost always the go-to option for most of the game for a single player. Using a simple move, Zoya can grapple onto the top of any platform she can connect to. In fact, I'd say that Zoya's grappling hook is slightly overpowered but it's just so much fun to use that I can't imagine anyone complaining. Except maybe during co-op play, since she's very likely to speed past many of the obstacles that actually pose a challenge to the other two players. But don't think that Zoya can solo the entire game. While she can get past most of the game's platforming challenges on her own, the ones she can't rely on Amadeus's magical abilities. In Trine, Amadeus can levitate any object that isn't nailed down and can conjure magical boxes and planks. Both abilities, conjuring and levitating, are essential to overcoming many of the game's platforming challenges and usually end up being fun to use. Sometimes they can feel a bit tedious, but for the most part, it's a great part of the game. During co-op, these abilities become even more applicable, since when a single player is stuck with Amadeus, these abilities end up having some legitimate combat potential, since enemies take damage from falling objects. Speaking of combat, Trine has a multitude of enemies to defeat throughout its campaign. However, basically all of them are skeletons. There are a few different configurations of skeletons, but even those start to feel samey by the end of the game. This lack of enemy variety would be addressed in later games, but in the original Trine, to say that combat encounters became repetitive would be a gross understatement. The enemies on their own wouldn't be much of an issue, since most combat encounters can actually be skipped by running past them. What prevents skipping combat, at least during an initial playthrough, is that some enemies drop experience points. Meaning that if you want to collect as much experience as you can, you need to kill every enemy you see. That wouldn't be so bad on its own, but Trine often has combat encounters with upwards of five waves of enemies spawning in, meaning that you'll often be spending up to four minutes fighting respawning skeletons. By all accounts, combat is the weakest aspect of Trine's gameplay. One of the best parts of Trine is its soundtrack. This soundtrack is filled to the brim with incredible songs by Ari Polkinen. I've been listening to this soundtrack on a regular basis for almost nine years, and I still occasionally get shivers when I listen to it. And there's only one song in the entire album that I consider to be mediocre. And it's basically an ambient track with no real music in it. Some of my favorite tracks include... 
I honestly can't praise this soundtrack enough. Of all the things that go into making Trine what it is, I think its soundtrack must be its keystone. Without it, the entire experience falls apart. And the tragic thing is that history probably won't remember Ari Polkinen for this game's music. If anything, he'll be remembered for writing the music to Angry Birds. I've gone on to listen to basically everything else that Ari Polkinen has written. And while he has still managed to write some incredible music, with some songs being better than his work in Trine, none of his albums have come close to Trine's in terms of the number of great tracks. Even Trine's sequels ended up having all manner of mediocre tracks compared to the one flop in the original game. Probably the most appealing part of Trine when it originally launched in 2009 was its visuals. Every level is a handcrafted 3D love letter to fantasy settings that reaches from the foreground all the way to the horizon. This was most impressive when the game launched, since at that time the gaming market had yet to be flooded with similar indie titles. Trine truly was a pioneer for its genre, and its visuals have aged surprisingly well. While the game was initially designed for the 720p era, Blowing it up to a high resolution on modern hardware still captures its inherent beauty. I have especially enjoyed replaying it using an ultra-wide monitor, though it's clear that the game didn't have this aspect ratio in mind, with skyboxes sometimes abruptly ending and level geometry sometimes being visible. Nevertheless, I think that Trine came out at just the right time to allow it to have graphics that would be able to stand the test of time. One of the criticisms against Trine when it first came out was that it was too short. While it is true that the game can be beaten in less than 5 hours during an initial playthrough, and less than 2 for a highly skilled player, I think that the game's length has ended up being a benefit. No level overstays its welcome, and no single music track loops too many times. Trine's longevity doesn't come from its inherent playtime. Instead, Trine feels like it was meant to be enjoyed briefly, with the knowledge that it will still be around in the coming years. And with each revisit, it will still feel like a tightly designed experience, just begging you to lose yourself in its rich, inviting world. If you haven't played Trine, and this rambling video has in any way piqued your interest, I highly recommend giving it a try. It regularly goes on sale for less than $3.00 with the entire Trine trilogy going on sale for less than $10. And no, I'm not sponsored by Frozen Bite. I just really love this series of games, and I wish it had the recognition I think it deserves. And who knows? Maybe one day, Trine will appear in some website's list of the top 10 indie game series of all time.